Got him. Got him. Got him. There we go. Boss. Crack. He's in the building, your boss. What up, Crack? Everybody who loves us is tuned in. Swiss Beats is super tuned in. Timberland, Steve Rifkin, everybody like Jesus Christ. This motherfucking machine better work for Buster Ross. Oh, it's <laughs> Yo, Buster, oh, I'm man. trying not right. to talk a lot because it's so much to talk about with you. I'm going to set it off by saying, uh, have you laid off showing your affection for your brothers, like slapping them five? Have you stopped? Slapping five that hard. <laughs> Yo, boss, you have left my shit black and blue. Is that on purpose, Buster Rhymes? The, 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 <laughs> you have picked me up in the air. Yo, yeah, I'm like, yo, why is this man? man? I'm scared of you, Buster Rhymes. I'm scared of you. Yo, crack. You, you know everybody's scared of your crazy ass. You know you <laughs> are the true terror squad terrorist. <laughs> I said, the other day I'm in Callie's house, you walk in with special, all I see is the shadow, I'm like, holy shit, we're gonna die. And as you came closer, I was like, oh shit, it's boss, yo, boss. What are you trying to do? Like, I know sometimes, I know other albums, you got cock D's, you cut up, you cut your dreads. Is it for the album, or, or like, you really just, just love that shit, and that's why you cock diesel like that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. First of all, I love you and congratulations on having one of the most incredible fucking platforms ever when it comes to getting people to pull up. Our peers, movie stars, athletes, politicians, all types. Yo, you are fucking this game up on a whole nother revolutionary level. So I super salute you for that, King. Secondly, it's an honor to be able to chop it up with my brother for over fucking 27. We did, we going on 30-something years of Yeah, brother. we like 30 years in. Bro, we we 30 years real. back. You know what I mean? Um, so it's it's an honor to be able to finally have a one-on-one -on -one building session. We do it off the record all the time. Oh, but off for, the record, for, me and you, we, we chop it up legend. Legendary. Um, but 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 just to answer your question about the fitness shit, right? The first time I did it because I just wanted and and I felt like I was at a, a, a crossroads in my life where I needed to just do something different and do something that was a reinvention and do something for me. You know what I'm saying? I felt like I just needed some kind of change on an improvement level when it just came to my my being. You know what I'm saying? This time, it's a little deeper than that because um, I fell off the wagon and after my father died, I, I fell off the wagon significantly. I just didn't give a fuck about a lot of shit. I wasn't caring about my health. I didn't care about... The only thing that was important to me was, was providing for my family and, and, and going to the studio. That was it. A lot of other shit that's supposed to be important to you at the time, I, I just kind of just didn't give a fuck about because I was going through something. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of the times, you know, us doing this shit that we doing, you know, when we go through shit as men, you know, we ain't really allowed to tell motherfuckers when we going through shit because motherfuckers are used that vulnerable, that vulnerable space against you. So when you're going through shit, a lot of the time you're wearing shit and you're walking around with, with shit that you got to wear and deal with on your own. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that shit, you know, it, it shows in ways when you really not caring about you as much as you should. Crack, I was up to 340 fucking pounds. Niggas was seeing it. I was watching it from people talking. I was hearing the comments that people was making. You see shit people say, and you hear shit people saying. You still don't make the decision to do something until you feel like you're ready to make the decision to do it. And whatever that thing is that you decide you're ready to do, it's only going to happen when you're ready. So for a long time, I walked around here with this motherfucking eight, nine-month-looking pregnant stomach. My skin was blotchy and shit. And 
you know, I was looking really unhealthy. I was, I was hearing myself breathe, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, once it started to get to that point, and I started bending over to tie my shoes when I was putting my sneakers on my Tim's on or some shit, and I had to actually halfway through tying my shoe, I had to stop and sit back up just to catch a breath. Mm -hmm. I'm bending over. I'm grunting like a wild fucking boar. That shit was wrong. Like, my oldest son had a conversation with some people that was around me one time, and he was expressing some concern about the health of his father. Because my son was too uncomfortable with coming to tell me because he didn't want to hurt his father's feelings. So that conversation came back to me from the people that he felt comfortable talking about his concerns with. And when they told me what it was, that shit broke my heart because I was like, damn, I'm, I'm letting my son down in a crazy way to the point where the way he looking at me is fucked up. You know, we got a lot of pressure. You know, yeah. Prodigy died on the road. Yeah. In the hotel room. Most artists die on the road in a hotel room, not surrounded by family. Right. And all we know how to do is work, get to the bag. Me and you, we done been to Africa, everywhere in the world. And we don't take time to really think about our health. We think about our family, giving them the shelter, and giving them all the things they want and, and, and taking care of them. And then sometimes we got to look at ourselves. You know, health is wealth, man. It's real and, shit. And if we don't take care of our health, it's nothing else. That's real shit. I, I ain't going to front. I pulled from you as a source of inspiration because you started shaving off mad weight. And I was looking at this shit like crack ain't playing and I'm out here looking crazier than I ever looked. And, and I'm looking at my brother who, who was known for being big and you made the, 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 the conscious effort and the decision to get your transformation popping in a real way. And you did this shit successfully. And I said, nah, I did this before. I know how to do this, but am I really ready to do it? You know what I'm saying? And you know, again, that conversation with my son and, and, you know, my people's from L.A. Actually, we was in L.A. and he had the conversation with, with this brother named H. And this brother named J. That be holding me down when I come to L.A. And um, when they when they pulled me to the side to have that talk with me, that shit cut deep. So, you know, I, I made a decision to get it get it together. I like resonated. He did the right thing. He, nah. he did the right thing. He nah, told he the right people because it got back to you in a real way. Real shit. And you respected that. Shout out to Swiss Beats. Y'all Swiss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, let me, let me, hold wait, wait, wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. Hold up. While we talking about this fitness shit, I want to big up Dexter Jackson, you know, who um he um helped me get it back to, together when I started this transformation journey last year, January. Um I want to big up Victor Munoz from Pro Edge because he's been my trainer from the first time I got right with the Big Bang album. And then after I finished doing my initial um, regimen for like a good four months with Dexter Jackson, I got back with Victor Munoz and continued to train with him up to now. And, you know, I got to tip my hat to him because he's been dedicated to this journey with me for shit. Around. 13, 14 years. You big will the car, fuck big somebody big... up. <laughs> you will beat the blood out of motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're not a regular yeah. guy. Like, this shit is like, I can't. Like, you were born to do this shit. Like, I know you was born to be an MC and a rapper, but this bodybuilding shit, you a love different it, type of brolic. I love it, crack. I love how I feel. I love how I'm breathing. I was on two blood pressure medicines. I'm off them shits, bro. I'm fucking loving the fact that, you know, when you hear people acknowledge how proud or how happy they are seeing my new look, my presence, my energy, the just the the vibe and just how I, I'm resonating. You know, I don't want to skip. You know, you know, me and you, me and you, Snoop Dogg, happy birthday, Snoop Dogg. Happy birthday to our brother Snoop. I fucking Snoop Dogg, love you, Snoop. we Snoop. love you, man. We worship you. Love you, Snoop. Snoop. Word. And, and big up, big up, special, big up, Jay Z, Nas. Uh, Word. We're part of a, 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 
an era of hip hop where we refuse to give up. We refuse. So I tell the people on here all the time, these major labels, they use you while they can. They suck it out of you. And then they throw you in the streets and you can fend for yourself. Many, I watch artists. 25, 26 years old, get dropped off a label and start doing old school tours at 26 years old. And I was like, yo, what the fuck? These dudes are still babies. But they fell for the major label telling you, yo, this and this and that. Our era said, fuck that. We bosses. We're going to do this as long as we feel like doing it. That's so a fact. Like you, huh? That's a fucking fact. Talk that shit. No, we don't give a fuck. We are own bosses. Believe and that. We love what we do, and we're gonna continue doing it excellent, like we want to. Because every time I look at a award show, the one thing you got is the plug to the award show. You always <laughs> front row. Fuck <laughs> 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 out front row to death. Grammy, BT. Everything. Like, you really enjoy that shit, one of them award shows, huh? I, I enjoy our life, crack. Like, you got to think about this shit, bro. We we, we, are, we doing something that we love a lot. Like, crack, you know what we was what we used to do and, and what we, we ain't allowed to talk about? And, you know, again, you know, it's interesting to see how everybody likes to talk about that shit in the street. And, you know... As much as we've lived and done and been around, we ain't really necessarily have to beat people in the head about how much shit was happening in the street that we was involved with. Motherfuckers just knew what it was based on the way we move. And we still live by those code of ethics. So, you know, it's 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 interesting to see that we come from that. We get this blessed opportunity and this gift to do this shit we do. We could go home eat a bowl of cereal in the morning, watch some shit on TV, catch an idea, record the motherfucker, and a million people, two million people fall in love with this idea. And we travel around the whole planet and feed our whole families off of this one idea for years. Mm -hmm. You know, and we come from a time where, you know, I hope that a lot of these newer artists and newer generation of artists get the opportunity to experience what it's like to see how a record you made 20 years ago, 25 years ago, still fuck a building up 20 to 25 years later. See, y'all got some time before y'all experience that. Y'all haven't experienced that yet. S salute to all of the successes happen when, happening with a lot of these new artists, you know, but you're still on a young journey. And y'all got a lot of time before y'all get to that place where you could really be able to say, I got a classic that has survived the test of times and my shit 20 year anniversary later celebrations is happening for real. Y'all ain't experienced that yet. You got way, you got, you got way too much, right? Hold on, let me go, let me go back. All right. <laughs> scenario, native tongue, scenario. You stood out in every remix you ever did, right? But let's go scenario. You're doing our city of war. Probably like your biggest first moment, right? Absolutely. Was it that moment that you said to yourself, yo, I'm going solo, fuck that. I'm a superstar one. Was it was it the, the City of All show when you did that before? When, at what point you said, leaders, I love you. I'm doing Buster Rhymes solo. I never said I wanted to do anything solo in my life. That happened by accident and by default and by circumstance. I never came into this shit trying to be a solo MC. So that moment when we did that Arsenio Hall concert, I just knew in that moment that I wanted to bust everybody ass on stage, period, even my brothers. Because, you know, the, the, the brothers that I was with, we was raised, and you come from the same time, crack. You know, we was never allowed to be okay with settling to be the weak link in the clique. Fuck out of here. Somebody else going to take the blame for that. Not me. Not you. So <laughs> yeah, You know how they used to refer, I won't say names, but they used to refer to certain legendary groups and be like, yo, 
That guy, he's the such and such of the crew. Like like the weak link, like the wild Real one. shit. Oh, God, that, yeah. that, 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 was, that was like the worst shit to ever have to walk around. No, you was definitely the Lauren Hill, the yeah, met the man that you was always you was always <laughs> that. You know what I'm saying? The stand yeah, out thank, thank you. But 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 the, again, again, crack, the, the me going solo part that happened after I realized there was no possibility or option left for me to be allowed to stay in my group. I was kicked out of my Elaborate. group. Elaborate, what happened, what happened that, that you felt like uncomfortable with the situation? I was kicked out of the group. Um, oh, come on. Yo, get the fuck out of here. Yo, what? They yo, yo, crack. I, they, crack, crack. I was kicked out the group before the first Leaders album came out. So when I got kicked out again after the second Leaders album, that's the second time I was being kicked out the group. So I got kicked out the group twice. I got kicked out before the first Leaders album came, and then I got kicked out again after the second Leaders album was done because, you know, it was a lot of competition. I was also the one that was getting most of the feature requests, most of the opportunities to collab with other artists it was becoming a tension builder with me and charlie brown and you know we beautiful now that's my brother like we we we, we finally got it right after a lot of years we didn't speak to each other for damn near 19 years bro but we got they it right they we, picked themselves up <laughs> <laughs> swiss we not shoot we not throwing no jabs tonight we're not doing that no Shout so, out to Charlie so, Brown. Hold on, let's skip. Let's skip from there. Shout out Charlie Brown. Oh, uh, shout, so out Dink, shout out, shout out Dinko D. Shout out Dinko D. And shout out Milo as well. Legendary group, legendary right. group, right? Uh, uh, they 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 put it down with you, legendary. We can't front our leaders for nothing. Um, right. so you let's go back to high school. You battled Jay Z, right? So we heard the story about how you battled Jay Z right. in high school. Right. Who else did you battle that became big be before they blew? I didn't really have a lot of battles with MCs before they blew because I was the dude that was cool with everybody. You know what I'm saying? So nobody didn't really want to battle me. A lot of motherfuckers wanted me to rhyme with them against other motherfuckers. Or mm -hmm. we just rhymed amongst each other just on some recreational let's keep each other's blades sharp type shit. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. it, it was important to make sure that if we was moving with each other, everybody in the circle was sharp. Everybody was dope. You know what I'm saying? So it was more about upkeeping the maintenance on that side than us trying to shit on each other and, and see who was better than who. You know, that would get displayed when you just had your turn to spit or you had your turn to shine. But we never at what really... point? At what point you met Biggie? I think I met you around. I would have to say like ninety three, ninety two. You met me ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, ninety two, ninety three. That's what I'm saying. So, but I know you from Brooklyn. So, did you know Biggie before he he took off? Yeah, Biggie went to school with me and Jay. That's what I'm asking. I mean, but I, I, but but I never saw, I never saw Biggie rhyme in school. Biggie never rhymed in school. You know what I'm saying? Me and Hov rhymed in school. Biggie never rhymed in school, but Biggie was rhyming then as well. You know what I'm saying? Biggie was in his, you know, he was in his, when he was in his space around, you know, his his block and his neighborhood and his area in a style, that's where Biggie was doing his shit. Um, so I didn't get the chance to experience Biggie rhyming in school. You know, in school, you know, I experienced burning burning the tree with Big in school. We blew trees in school regularly. Biggie Biggie made sure that the he made sure if you needed your trees, you had your trees in school. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> Biggie 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 Biggie. Now, I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip because I gotta say this legendary story. All right. I'm at uh, Daddy's house. I'm with Biggie. I'm with Puffy, and you walk in. I don't know if you remember this. But this, this right. is a real story. You walk in, and you come in, you say, yo, yo, turn everything off, you and split. And you, you walk in, I remember in this moment say, like yesterday. 
I remember Yo. this moment like yesterday. Go ahead, though. I'm going to let you tell it. I'm going to let you tell it. one of the greatest it. moments of my life. <laughs> no. Yo, yo, listen. This is one of the greatest moments of my life. So you walk in, you say, yo, turn that shit off. I want to play something. We like, yo, boss, chill, chill, chill. It's like three in the morning. <laughs> you like, fuck that. Turn the shit off. I'm going to play something. Split is hype. And they press play. And it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> but doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> And then you start performing and Split is diving on the board underneath the area with the dilly, yo. Dilly with it. And next thing you know, me and Big start jumping. Ah! <laughs> oh my God, yo, bus. That was one of the most incredible moments of my life. Yo, crack. I'm going to keep it a buck. I'm going to keep it a buck, right, crack? And I'm going to always tell the story. That record happened because one day I was sitting with Puff. And the nigga Puff going to tell me, you know, yo, bus. You need to stop screaming on all of your records, my nigga. Bitches, bitches don't want to do the rah rah like a dungeon dragon with you on all your songs, my nigga. So why don't you just, just, just sexy it out one time? You know what I'm saying? And so I was like, "What you mean?" He was like, "Just, just use your regular voice on a joint one time, and just, just tone it down a little bit. Like you ain't gotta be, rah, rah, rah. you ain't gotta do that on every song." So. I said, all right, I'm going to try it. So this dude named Gerald Odom, we called him Fab Fabrice at the time. That was his little nickname when he thought he was on some, some handsome shit for the chicks. <laughs> he was my road manager. And, um, you know, we all came up together with this this, this real dope MC and, and producer. And, and his name is Shamelo D. And this other brother named, uh, epitome of Scratch Grand Cut and this other brother named Buddha. And them three dudes produced Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See. And when I think Fab used to stay at their crib a lot. So when they made the beat, Fab heard it. And he brought the shit to me at the stool. And when I heard the beat, I lost my motherfucking mind. And I was so proud of Fab for bringing it straight to me after they did it that I told Fab Go in the booth and do the Diddy ad libs. Try to mock Diddy and shit. That's why you hear the nigga in the fucking background that's like, uh huh. And and let's go. Nine seven. That little nigga that you hear in the background is the road manager nigga that was with me that found the beat, brought it to the stool. And I was like, fuck it, I want you to do the Diddy on it. So he did the Diddy ad libs. I did what Diddy suggested and I hit the shit on some calm shit. And the reason why all of the words was at the end of the rhyme ended with yo was because when we used to go out of town in DC and VA and Philly when Reaganomics ever was live and we was moving shit in the street. See, the West Indian dudes to blend in and, 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 and make themselves seem like they was American these niggas would just add the word yo to their regular Jamaican accent. Like that shit was Americanizing them. Because, you know, we always be like, yo, what's good? Yo, what up, yo? So a Jamaican nigga be like, like, yo, fat Joe, yo. Give me a hundred dollars, yo. We need a hundred dollars so we can buy our shoes, yo. So the nigga talking regular Jamaican accent, but he throw the yo at the end of it like it's Americanizing him. So that shit was always funny to me, right? So when I was doing the song, I was just kind of mimicking this Jamaican dude that used to be on the corner of our block in East Flatbush, Brooklyn on Troy Avenue in church in East Flatbush. And when me and Spliff used to go on the road and come back home, this dude was like, he looks. He used to dress like he was a homeless motherfucker, but he wasn't. This nigga was hustling on the corner, and he used to get to the bag all the time. But he used to act like he ain't had no money. So we used to come back. We on our early celebrity shit with with my solo run. Leaders is over now. It's me and Spliff, Scratch It Tour. We all come from this block. So 
the nigga would see us when we get back home from off the road and the nigga be like, like if we was just on Arsenio, like you said, or if we was on In Living Color or something, the nigga would see us and be like, hey, yo, Busta, split star, yo. I mean, what, $100, yo, I'm hungry, man, need some food, yo. So we used to look at this nigga and laugh at the nigga. So we had to go to the studio to record the song and we seen him on the block earlier that day before we went to the session. So I just took from that and put it in the song. Hit you with no delay and say, what you saying, yo? Silly with the nine milli, what the dilly, yo? When I be on the mic, I do my duty, yo? I was just mocking the fucking dude on the corner of the block. Wow, yeah. fucking we and, and, and I, the shit be right there. It be, right, be right in your fucking right face. in your fucking face, bro. A lot of the times the diamonds is right in the face. Be staring the gift horse for. in the face. All the time you staring <laughs> the gift horse in the fucking face. <laughs> hey, you know what they're doing, y'all? Hey, y'all, y'all, boss, man. I I never forget that day. That was beautiful. You know, I also my also claim the fame. I got two more claim the fans, but it's about me, but I'm gonna keep it about you. Is I was there with Biggie uh, made hypnotized. I was in the studio with him. And Diamond oh my D's God. first album, I'm every ad lib on Diamond D's whole first album. I'm every ad lib wow. on every song. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I ain't never knew that, bro. I never knew every that, that's crazy. Every crap. I'm the background crazy. All right, yo, that, that motherfucker. <laughs> I know your relationship, yeah. your relationship with B.I. Pac, did you have any relationship with Pac in them days? I had an, you was big and he I had was an big. Incredible, I had an incredible relationship with Pac. Um, wow. Me and Pac been friends from early leaders days. When he, before he put out his solo shit, when he was still just dancing with Digital Underground. Um, Interesting story of one of the early Pac interactions. So we had a we had a college date to do. We had to do a show at a, at a college, and Digital Underground was performing and Leaders was performing. We only on our first album, right? And we had to do sound check. So we get to the sound check a little bit late. Digital had already did their sound check, and we get there a little late. Digital broke out. I think Pac and Money B were still in the, in the neighborhood. I don't know where Money B was exactly, but he, Pac wasn't there by himself. You know what I'm saying? So we're getting ready to do the sound check. The, 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 the sound man was on some bullshit because I guess we took too long, so it was time. He felt like, fuck that. I'm not sticking around to do the sound check. Right? So he's shutting shit down and he acting like he getting ready to leave. And we kind of like on some damn, we really want to get this sound check done. And the crazy shit is Pop, he kind of saw that there was a little bit of friction going on. And he just came and involved himself in the situation. And, and Pop turned to this white man and he was just like, yo, he said, um, I need, I need, I need, um, I need you to cut this motherfucking soundboard on. Leaders of the new school going to get their sound check done right now. Fuck you talking about you ain't turning on the equipment. And he, he just started spazzing on dude. And, you know, the, the, the man wasn't trying to hear what Pac was talking about. So he acting like he, he breaking the fuck out. So. Pac just ran up on this motherfucker and started choking him. You motherfucker, you fucking. So we had to grab Pac because we like, Pac, we, we not asking for all of this, bro. Chill, my nigga. Like, we, we, we just want to sound check. This ain't war, bro. But that's the type of dude Pac was. He really went out his way to extend his love and show yeah. his love. And Every it, time it, I seen Tupac, he was in violence. Every single time I've, I've met him in my life, any time I ever had an interaction with him, he was. I seen him beating up the bull ages on 125th. He walk in the club, he looking for somebody with the hammer. Yo, Joe, you seen such and such? Nah, Pac, I see him in Atlanta with two hammers. I see him at, anywhere I seen Tupac, 
It was violence involved. Yeah. I, you know what you know what it was, bro? I think. And you know, it, it, it's 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 a little frustrating for me, but it's the truth. I think Pac just really felt he just felt I think he 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 took on more of this responsibility to have to prove his love when he didn't really need to. And a lot of the times the love that I felt the love that I guess he felt he needed to show people that he wanted in return, he was already getting it. Mm. You get what I'm saying? I, I just, I don't know why he felt the need to go above and beyond to the point where he would get himself in trouble just to prove to somebody that he got real love for him or he'll do something to somebody for the person he loved because that's what ended up getting him killed. You know, mm. the situation mm. that happened in Vegas, you know, he went and got himself involved with something that ain't have nothing to do with him. But because he was moving with those dudes from that team, he felt like he had to go out of his way to prove to them that he gonna ride for his family, his team, whoever he moving with. And it unfortunately ended up the way it did. But this has been a thing with bro that it's a it's a it's it's beautiful in one sense because you know your man is holding you down no matter what. No matter what. You know what I'm saying? But it's also the thing that got him into a lot of situations that he could have avoided. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Or, oh, for sure. Uh, so with that said, was you in a weird position? And I don't really want to elaborate, but being that you knew him since Digital Underground and he had uh, beef with Big, was you ever in a weird position being cool with both of them? Or it was like, yo, bus, bus, he's neutral, whatever the case may be. You know how we was raised, Crack. You know when you know and you're friends with two people that are conflicting you're supposed to be the neutralizer you're supposed to be the one to try to do whatever you can to squash it you ain't supposed to pick no side I'm not gonna lie I was closer to Big even though I knew Pac first because I went to school with Big I was in Big's home mm -hmm. I hug and kiss Big's mother she hugs mm -hmm. and kisses me you know, C's and all of them. We all, we grew together. Mm. You know, I knew Pac, but I haven't been in Pac's home. I, you know, I don't know the late, great, beautiful of Fanny Shakur, his mom. I, you know, we didn't have the same interaction based on us not living in the same proximity and space. So, you know, the, the circumstances is what created my relationship dynamic to be much stronger with Big and D-Rock and Kim and C's and the whole Junior Mafia, Biggie's moms, you know, me and Diddy, you know, that's one of my closest friends in the world. So, you know, and we was all on this side, you know, we was seeing each other crossing paths. So it, it was it was really tough for me to be in the middle of that. I mean, it was also like when I saw Pac and Q-Tip had beef. Um, Tribe. I never knew this. This is a joker moment. This is a joker <laughs> moment. I never knew yeah, Pac and Q-Tip had beef. Yeah, Pac and Q-Tip had a very serious and a very intense beef. Like, thank you, Gonzalo. Um, this is during the time when I'm shooting Higher Learning movie. Right? We talking like 93, 92. And Source Awards, before they started to air on television, was at that same location um, at the Paramount Theater in Madison Square Garden. 
Mm. At least that's what it was called at the time, I believe. Mm -hmm. This is the same stage where Suge Knight tried to dish puff at that Source Awards. So this particular Source Awards, I believe, was the one or two of them before that particular moment, right? So me, Tupac, Omar Epps, we were staying in the Oakwood Apartments, which is the fully furnished apartments in L.A. on Hollywood Boulevard in Fuller. I stayed there before. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about, right? So in this particular crib, it's, it's, it's like buildings full of fucking fully furnished apartments. Pac was in one floor. Omar Epps was on another floor. I'm on my floor. We bouncing back and forth to each other's cribs the whole time we out there shooting movies. And Tupac, during this time frame, had to go to New York because he was performing at this particular Source Awards. So this is when we was all performing off of that tapes, crack. Mm -hmm. So you know, once the motherfucking engineer press play on your DAT tape, it ain't like you could stop that shit and play. No, 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 you got to go. You got to go, right? <laughs> So, Tribe was performing, no, Tribe was doing their acceptance speech for best group of the year. They had won the award for that that year at the source. And Tupac was supposed to be the, the next performance after their acceptance speech was complete and Pac got introduced, right? So, somehow the production person, the stage production manager, wasn't paying attention to what was really happening. And the motherfucker ended up pressing play in the middle of the tribe acceptance speech. So Pac just comes out there performing all over their speech like he was shitting on their speech. You feel me? So that wasn't Pac's fault, but it looked like a flagrant Pac dish. It looked like some Pac shit. Right. It looked like a flagrant pop dish. Pop 101. Right. So, you know, and, and at the time, because Pop, you know, had this little rep of being a little bit of a loose cannon, it looked like, all right, here he go again. Right? So, the beef starts. Pop comes off the stage, tribe, they with Zulu Nation, and shit get crazy. So it ain't lead to no blows, but a, a, a pressure was was very intense between Tribe and Pac at the time. And they ended up fortunately not going to blows, but they didn't walk away from that shit with the beef squashed. Mm. So it was going to lead to something if they crossed paths again and somebody didn't step in to intervene and mediate and try to put it to, to bed. Pac came back to the Oakwood Apartments. And, and you there. Yeah, and I'm there. And he, he know my relationship with Q-Tip. So he gave me the call and said, you got to come check me real quick. So I come in, I pull up on Pac. When I pull up on Pac, we ain't even talk about it right away. I'm just, I, I get to his apartment and we in there chilling and he actually got mad blood all over the place. And and he he had an MPC sixty beat machine in his apartment, and it was looping this Isley Brothers sample, and he had wrote about three four songs to the same sample for different records, which was confusing to me because I never saw that. Like I write one song to a beat, I'm not writing a different song to the same beat. Pop wrote three or four songs to this same sample. And we blowing tree and, you know, I, I ain't want to seem anxious to know what he was talking about because, you know, it's also the vibe. The, we hanging around, we blowing tree, we just bobbing and chilling. So it almost was like he forgot to talk to me about what he called me to talk to him for because he had got caught up in writing these songs. Mm -hmm. So I eventually said to him, you, you, you wanted to holler at me about something? And he go, oh, yeah. So... You know, this is what happened with me and Q-Tip, and I know you and Q-Tip is like brothers. 
and it wasn't my fault. They pressed play on the deck. I fucking hear my song. I go out there. I got to do what I'm doing. I didn't, you know, I'm focusing on the shit that I got to do. So I wasn't even really paying attention to the fact that they was doing their acceptance speech. And when they approached me on some shit, I didn't know what it was about. I need Q-Tip to know I wasn't on no bullshit. Like, I got unbelievable respect for Tip and Fife and Tribe. So could you get us on the phone? Because he ain't have Tip number. So I called Tip, and I, I, I talked to Tip about Pac getting on the phone, wanting to talk to him. Him and Pac spoke. And what's the dude that used to be on BT with the light brown eyes and shit? Donnie Simpson or something? Donnie Simpson, the, Donnie the Simpson. green eye guy. What? He was still on BET at the time. He's still fly, by the way. He works at a radio station in DC. He's still, he's the Billy D's of the game. He's still fly. Oh, that's he's a fact. He's still on the radio in DC. And, and, he, and he got the motherfucking um, Billy D. Williams voice for real. He, he definitely, <laughs> <laughs> big up to Donnie Simpson. Legend, legend, legend. So Tip and Pop spoke. They actually squashed the shit. And they were now trying to strategize a way to get on BET and do a public truce. And it didn't get to happen. Interestingly enough, during that same time frame, Pac, this is when Jack the Rapper was still popping. You know all about Jack the Rapper, crack. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Jack That's the Rapper. That's when I met Tupac. Right. So Jack the Rapper comes and Pac was redoing, he was fully restoring us, I think like a 667 Chevy Impala or a 64, something like that. And he had it fully done up. He shipped the shit down to Atlanta. He goes down there. Couple days pass and shit. You hear about this police shooting with these off-duty cops that Tupac was involved in. Tupac comes back to L.A. And when he gets back to L.A., me and Omar pulled up on him, check him and shit. And then, the, you know, we was vibing for a minute, and then Omar left, and I stayed. The difference was, you know, Pac was still on his, put a loop on on the MPC, write a bunch of songs of that shit, steam a bunch of weed but this time he was a lot more paranoid because he thought as a result of that situation transpiring down there you know the police is the whole united states the niggas are put a calling in a different state and they police friends or brothers in the next city are come and see you he felt something like that was going to happen as a result of what transpired in atlanta in la so he just was on some super paranoid, constantly looking out the window shit. He got his ratchet closet right. Like, he really thought somebody was coming to get him at that point. But just watching Pac go through all of these phases, I'm saying all of this to say the situation with him and Big and the discomfort for me was Pac had gotten to a place where there wasn't really no talking to him. There really wasn't no ability to mediate the situation. He had gotten a little too far gone with what he had surrounded himself with becoming a part of the death row family. And, um, you know, there was yeah, other... I know. When I first had beef for 50 Cent, couldn't nobody talk to me off that mountain. Like, I was okay. like... It was all smoke. I lost friends. If a friend of mine worked with him or anything, yeah, I was like on some beyond bullshit. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I know it could get to a place like that. I'm gonna skip because I'm because 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 I keep seeing too many of our friends are on here. Right. Michael Rap Report, Daz Dillinger. Uh, salute, salute, salute to Daz Dillinger. Daz, Daz what? is on here. Word uh, up. Michael Rap Report. Uh, What's up, Mike? What up, Mike? What up, boy? But I'm going to be honest with you. The names that won't stop is this fucking Switch Beats and Timberland. 
Right? Switch, switch so beats now, to Timberland is our motherfucking up, brothers now. Come on now. Hold up. These are I'm, my I'm brothers. I'm not even going to lie. I'm ready to get to that talk for real, for real. Yo, let's, let's see get what's to going that. on. Let's hold get up, to that. Up. Fuck you mean. Let's get to that. Boss. Matter of fact, matter of fact. Can hold I, up, hold up, boss. I, I know I need a drink now. Now, now I'm, a, all right, I'm a, all right, all right. Let me, let me, right. let me. Yo, let me, let me, this let me up. get my, this my up. fire. I'm going to get my Ciroc too. You know what I'm saying? Let me. I'm loading up. Water. I'm loading oh, up. I pass my Ciroc by Black the excellence. Sir. Let's go. The people wait. <laughs> hey, yo, Diddy. Diddy, Diddy. Diddy, we going to rep you all the time, bro. It ain't just going to be on Joe Crack side. We got it on this side, too, bro. Fuck you mean. Hey, yo, big up my man Will Castro from Unique. You know we Castro. love him. You know we love Castro. He just left me. Cheers I to you. Will Hold Castro. Up. You know, mix me up, King, please. I got I to gotta toast with you the right way. Let me get my glass in my hand. The floor is yours, crack. Floor is Shout yours. out Anthony Ramos from Brooklyn on here. Hold up. Big up my brother motherfucking Webb real quick. Kev Webb, Spider Webb, Brooklyn. He's Flatbush. Biscuit, salute. The whole Shout out to my family. dog special. special my motherfucking, out there in my the motherfucking brother. My motherfucking brother special EMT. <laughs> Fuck you mean. Big up Split Shout Star. Out. Hold up, hold up. Split Star, the efficiency corner colonel. I can't not be a Split Star, I want to do it better. I, I, I got something I got to tell you about Split after this. <laughs> right. Split needs a rollout. He's wait, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, hold on. One more. I saw my oldest son who gave me that conversation that I was talking to you about with my with my unhealthy he shit. On He's on here. Big up my, my oldest son, the head to the throne, to Zaya. I love you, my young king. And all the rest of my beautiful kids, I love all of y'all. <laughs> Yo, boss. What up, champ? So this. AB Butler, hold up. AB, I see you, AB, I see you, AB. Yo, boss, AB, my brother. I love AB. <laughs> He's the super real one. That's a fact. I got a lot of in him. That's a fact. That's Yo, a one fucking time, fact. Hold up, crack. One time I was going to fight. Can we toast properly okay. now? Here you go, my brother. You know I love you, brother. We toast all the time, so man. We toast all the time. You know I God love you, brother. I'm proud. No. A much finer vodka. So now let me just tell AB, one time I was going to fight 30 security guards, the cock diesel dudes, three seven-footers, this, this, that. They thought they were going to finally beat up that Joe. And everybody was there. It was at uh, the All I Do Is Win video. And everybody was acting like they didn't see that Fat Joe was going to get pounded out. I really was going to get pounded out. These dudes was like, turn security or whatever. Right. And B walks over, I swear to God, and <laughs> says to me and said, yo, crack, I'm with you. Too deep. <laughs> <laughs> yo. AB and he comes, yo, worry. he won my respect to the end of life. Like to the, he stood next to me. You know, he little. Like, yo, crack, I'm with you as whatever. But, you know, long story short, we told the 30 security, one step closer, we shooting your face off. <laughs> and they stopped <laughs> in the tracks. Yeah. So, I didn't really want, they, they not beating me up. But anyway, let's forget that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> T.I. comes on here. Yeah. He's talking about New York rappers. He's, he, he he goes at fifty. I don't know why. I T. saw I. that. King. Let's not get it fucked up. That's yeah, That's that's, that's, my, that's 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 my brother. And Goody Mob came in and said, "Here's the king of the south." Goody Mob told me this. By the way, Goody Mob told me you the one who 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 who, who put all that knowledge in them that they was they were speaking on on that first album. And all I, that, uh, I love I love Goody Mob so much. They were very, very close to me at the time. We used to all be in Dallas, Austin. We gonna get back to Ti. We always we was all very close to each other in Dallas Austin studio in Atlanta back in '93, '94. This is when I just broke up with leaders, and I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. I was confused for a minute. Dallas Austin called me. He reached out to me and said, yo, bus, come to Atlanta. I get to Atlanta. He 18 years old, $4 million motherfucking facility called Dark Studio, Dallas Austin Recording Projects. 
He got about six, seven million dollars worth of cars in the front of the studio, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, all type of shit. His fucking wall is full of plaques of shit he produced. TLC's albums, fucking five, six, seven million. Another bad creation albums, double, triple platinum. Boys the Men, 10 million. Clive Davis loved Dallas because he was a genius with his art as a producer, as a songwriter. And he was young. He was the fresh, new, motherfucking wave. He had his finger on the pulse of what was going on. He knew how to hit the center of the bullseye, not only when it came to making a hit record, but when it came to being able to make them records that was hits that was going to generate a shitload of fucking money. On top of that, Dallas Austin had a conversation with me because he knew that I had Rampage as my artist. And he was like, yo, I like Rampage. You know what I'm saying? And while you figuring out what you're doing with your solo shit, now that you broke up with leaders, let's put this executive hat on you. I got the label deal with Arista, with Clive Davis, with Riley Records. So, you know, I'm distributed by the major. And, you know, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a give you this production deal. And, you know, me and you going to partner up. We're going to put out Rampage through your shit. So that nigga powered me up. He gave me the fucking Pac-Man super pellets and shit. I powered up crazy. And I put my executive hat on for the first time. This is when Flip Mode is born. So I needed a company name for my company through Dallas, my production company. And he was like, you got to come up with a name. Give me a name and I'm going to help you get the logo. So I'm sitting and I'm thinking of my lyrics to shit that I might have said that was cool to me that would rep my company and rep me best. I go to the second scenario, the scenario remix, and um, there's a part in the rhyme when I say, open up your mouth if you want the food to get rude, flip mode, because I'm in the mood. <laughs> yeah, man, that's how it goes. Body get broke up, blood coming out the nose. So that, that line, flip mode, I said, that sound like me because I like flipping the mode on shit. I, always, I don't like doing shit regular. So I go back to Dallas and I say, I want to name my shit Flip Mode Entertainment. And I'm going to build an artist roster and call him Flip Mode Squad. So Dallas goes. He said, I'm going to get back to you with some logo options. And he comes back to me and he presents me like six options. And the one that the world finally got to see is the one that I got from Dallas flip mode so like you look at it there's an upside down flip mode and then there's a right side up every time you turn it around it reads right side up i said this is the uh, dopest fucking logo ever so i take the name we start flip mode entertainment rampage comes out with his first single beware the ramp sack that shit did all right then we come right after that with wild for the night we flatline and shit so while i'm going through this with dallas in dark studio george clinton used to be there George Clinton, you know, Goody Mark, Gip from Goody Mark, you know, Joy, you know, um, the mother of Gip's child and a beautiful friend and she's a queen and a royal empress. She was a part of that from the beginning stages. Monica was a part of that. I was looking at Monica when she was 13 years old coming in there with a voice like she was, she was Aretha Franklin at 13. Yeah, that's what they was telling me. It was like Monica was like one of the guys. TLC was in there like it was the crew. Oh, yeah. TLC was in there crazy. Left out. Shout out Jermaine me. Dupree on the check-in. Jermaine so, Dupree. So, so, salute, salute to Jermaine Dupree. Your boss, do, boss. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. You got to let me finish. Okay. Sorry, crack. No, no. Got, you, okay. you, this, is, this is who you got on the show today. All right. I know. Boss the boss. You know I'm doing no smoke. You, 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 know, you, know, you know we got too much history. You're going to let me talk. I now. Dallas had George Clinton in his spot. Me, Joy, Gip, all of us. Monica, everybody. We At random moments, we always was crossing paths in Dallas's headquarters. And when George Clinton pulled up in there, it was like, okay, Jesus Christ is here. You feel me? So he used to school us so much to the high sciences that it was incredible to, to sponge up shit from this man that we getting firsthand from somebody that been ripping shit from the 70s, fucking the game up with music when we was just being born. And this shit is still timeless classic shit now that we have age to make music ourselves. 
but he started to give us, he gave me this book called Behold a Pale Horse written, written by William J. Cooper. And that book is what completely changed my whole perspective. That combined with, of course, being, you know, a member of the 5% nation of the gods and earths. So, you know, I'm already dealing with high science shit. So by the time George Clinton gave me this book, I was so intrigued by the sciences. I was already getting being 5%. I just gravitated to this shit. Sponged up the book. That book and the sciences turned my whole album catalog into the coming, when disaster strikes, extinction level event, anarchy, Genesis, it ain't safe no more, Big Bang, all that shit came from the everlasting impression that those moments left on me. Mm. Gabe Gippen them the book. It turned, mm. it turned Goody Mob into Cell high therapy. scientists as well. They was high scientists too. Cell therapy came. Um, I don't know if that might have even bled into Outkast because they were Southern Cadillac playlistic music first and then they went to AT Aliens real quick. Yeah. You feel me? But what I'm saying is Dallas was the, he was the, the nucleus to the cell of all of this. EPMD broke up. Dallas called Eric Sermon, told him to come up here and put that executive hat on and get your Def Squad shit popping and let's go. Mm. When Andre Harrell let go Diddy, God bless the soul of Andre Harrell. He called Diddy and told Diddy to come to Dop Studio, pull up, let's put this executive hat on. I'm going to introduce you to Clive Davis and you're going to get this bad boy shit started and you're going to go. Dallas Austin was responsible for a lot of us becoming powerful. He was the, he was really, believe it or not, Dallas is the guy that all of this black excellence, powerful executive in hip hop started from. Mm. It was Dallas. I, I'm talking about, this is what I'm witnessing firsthand. He was already on with his own label before any Def Squad, Flip Mode, or Bad Boy. He had Rowdy already moving and shaking. So I'm saying all of this to say that the 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 the, the Goody Mob shit, the careers of Monica, my executive hat, Eric Sherman's executive hat, Diddy's executive hat, all of this shit happened in Atlanta at Dallas Austin's studio. Wow, wow. That's the biggest Jopra moment ever. That's the biggest Jopra moment ever. And let me tell you something. His mother knows how to cook, bro. I've been to that house on Sundays. Hey, yo, listen, bro. I've been, I've to, been that, to that house. I've been to that beautiful house. When, I don't know if she's still in Stone Mountain. But the it was with a, the spaceship. It looked like a spaceship. Oh, you, you talking about Dallas or Dallas' mom? Dallas Austin. Right. No, his crib is the Enterprise from Star Trek. It's that spaceship. And he built the shit from the ground up. And 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 and, and they, they they Dallas is just on such another level of shit. Like he had the incredible Lenny Kravitz design his crib, man. They they designed that house together, man. Like, bro, Dallas has always been one of the most profound forward thinkers that I've ever met to this day. And I'm singing that man his praise because I've watched too many years pass by. And I don't even hear him get this kind of acknowledgement from anyone even closest to him. And I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody because there's so many okay. people of them. But I, my I got to know. I'm going to invite him on the show. You got you, to. You just set it off, and we're going to, me and him, we're going to talk. Let's get yeah. it to right now. The biggest thing in COVID, the whole shit, the, the world stopped in 100 years, and versus. T.I. Yeah. called out 50 Cent. He came on here, he sounded like he had a real problem with New York rappers and all that. I don't know why we've always embraced him. Let's go. <laughs> now, Buster Rhymes wants to smoke. Everybody's scared of you. I, I believe that it should have been. It, well, I can't say what I was going to say right now. But Buster, I look at Buster Rounds like Snoop Dogg. Like, so many hits that it's almost impossible to even face somebody like Buster Rounds or Snoop Dogg. Uh, T.I. is a legend, king of the South. Uh, 
would you battle a celebration of, of hip hop, of music, T.I. on verses? Would you go for T.I. and do this? Everybody's listening. First of all, happy belated birthday to my brother T.I. Second of all, me and T.I. have one of the most incredible relationships. We don't got to speak every day. T.I. know how I stand tall for him. I put myself in the line of fire for T.I. whenever I need to because I love that. I love that brother like my brother for real. But the one thing about me that I think everybody knows pretty well, I respectfully compete beyond description. I sit in the fucking smoking section. I smoke cigars, the most pristine cigars. I smoke a little bit of bud now because I'm on my health and wellness fitness. So I don't smoke tree like I used to. But I sit in the most congested smoking section with all the bud smokers, period. <laughs> Let me finish. I might just purposely drive one of my older vehicles that I ain't get tuned up recently because that muffler smoke's still black and it might need an oil change. Ride around with that shit and just pollute the environment for no reason. <laughs> I might just blow a few little motherfucking steam puffs out of my nostrils if I get in the mood on some dragon shit for real when it comes to this smoke shit. T.I., it is intriguing to me that you have such a concern with New York MCs. I want to understand what that's about, but from one brother that loves you to my brother that knows I love him, I'm begging you to step in the ring with me. I'm a, I'm a bust your ass. And let me tell you something. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. We're gonna do it with grace. But I'm a, I'm a bust Ti. I'm a bust your ass. C come on, Ti. Let's have fun. Woo! Let's have fun, Ti. This is quick. This is quick. Let me tell you something. Let's have fun, Ti. <laughs> but it's going to be quick. It's going to be a quick, exponential sleep response ASAP. You it's know, I know my brother. Quick. But see, T this, is, this is why I have to say it this way. Because T.I., he don't play no games. He don't sugarcoat shit. And he's not no fucking half-stepper. And with me knowing that T.I. accepts every and any challenge, I got to make sure that I'm clear about accepting every and any challenge with him. And that's you got, it. You got people, Remy just commented, he want all the smoke. Everybody's going crazy right now. This shit, <laughs> breaking news is going down, T.I. Buster. It's going down. There's no way around it. It's no way around it. Versus is going down. We, You know, T.I.'s going to respond whenever he wants. We both know he doesn't back down from the smoke. He don't back down uh, from uh, shit. And I love him for it, because this is who he has always been. He don't back down from nothing. This is what makes, this is what the art and the culture was built on. We ain't supposed to back down from shit. If everybody running around here talking about how they the best this MC that, and all, you hear that shit all the time. Fuck talking about that. Be about that. Then if you really believe that, show me better than you could tell me. Because I don't know no other way. I believed it so much when I didn't even know how to do it. That belief came to fruition for me and for a lot of us. Because we believed it that much. You know, this shit that we do, it ain't no book science. They ain't teaching us this shit in no school. The reason why it happens is because we believe it so fucking much. We want it so fucking bad. That somehow there's a thing going on with you and something greater than man with this energy you put in the universe and it comes back and it comes to fruition. I ain't fixing shit that ain't broke. That shit always works for me. I want to smoke bad and I want it with my brother T.I. Let's fucking go. Nothing else to talk about. I mean, if you want to keep talking about it, I'm cool, but I think I'm going to No, 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 no. We know it's out there. It's, it's in the, it's Cheers, T.I. Yeah. Cheers, T.I. <laughs> yo, yo, nah, nah, it's out, it's gone. It's, it's nothing we can do about it. Shout out my cousin, Carmencita. She's the number one Buster Rhymes fan. 
She's going crazy <laughs> in these comments right here. I can't, <laughs> I can't control the shit. She going nuts. <laughs> Yo, crack, you fucking set this up. You lined this up just now. No, I you, did not. You knew what up. you they, they, you knew what you was fucking doing. You no, you you hey. set us, you set this up. And I no love fuss. it. And I love it. <laughs> I fucking love it. Fuck you mean. Yo, bust. Yo. That would be the most incredible. Buster Rhymes T.I. will be the most incredible. The man got hits. The man, the king of the South. And you bust a bust. You're an institution. Like, I wonder if, like, when certain rappers eventually, 100 years from now, die, God forbid, is they going to be in, like, museums and shit? Like, like, it got to be a Buster Rhymes section in the fucking Museum of Nazis. <laughs> no, I swear to God. Like, yo, Buzz. Go ahead. You've been around since this shit. And Crack you up. consistently stay on everybody. The kids love you from the Chris Brown. Every time I think of it, 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 Yo, Buzz, let me tell you something. Uh... Shout out to Mona Scott. Listen. I, Sylvia Rose. Shout out to Mona Scott. Sylvia, they are the mothers and the architects of what molded and shaped Buster Rhymes career-wise and professionally. I don't know what the fuck I would have been able to do without those two incredible women. But you know, women are the greatest nurturers. I was in the best care with those women involved with my life. That's the reason why my wins were so great. They took care of me like I was their child, like I was their younger brother. They loved me for real to this day. I loved the both of them indescribably. Like they are forever etched in the DNA of my legacy. You know what I'm saying? And you know, ain't none of this shit gonna happen without me giving it up to my mother. You know, everybody, I just want y'all to be clear. My mom's had to sign my record deal when I was 17, December 12th, 1989. And she could have woke up in a mood that day because maybe I misbehaved the night before while I'm still living in her crib. And she could have said, fuck you, I ain't signing shit. Go take your ass out and go get some fucking chores done in the house and shut your ass up and sit down. But my mom's was one of the strongest supporters of this shit. My mom used to cook good Jamaican food and bring that shit to the studio to feed me, Charlie Brown, and Dinko 12 o'clock at night. Mm. Get up out of bed, drive to the studio while we was in the studio with Chuck D and them shit was at in Hempstead, Long Island. Mm -hmm. When we was trying to figure it out and feed us to make sure that we had our stomach full so we could be at our fullest when it was time to work. Plus, was you, was you ever signed to Chuck D? No, we was never signed to Chuck D or Hank Shockley, but they gave us everything. Chuck D gave me everything. He gave me my name, Buster Rhymes. They gave us the name leaders of the new school. They gave us the fundamentals, the code of ethics, the fiber, the infrastructure, the understanding, this, the whole navigation system on how you needed to be to be at your fullest how you needed to be to be a well-rounded artist, how you needed to be so that motherfuckers would have a difficult time competing with you. I know you was there when Ice Cube was working on his album out there. America's oh. Most Wanted. I was there from the beginning before the first song was recorded. Big up the Ice Cube. And you know something? It's interesting, not to veer off, we're going to come back to that. But it's interesting to watch people, these countless voiceless people in this era and in this time frame that should be lucky they didn't come from our time frame. See, our time frame, you can't just ask somebody's name and talk disrespectfully and hide behind your little fucking computer. You said shit, you needed to be conscious of how you spoke because you couldn't speak behind a computer. When you said shit, it was usually being said to someone. 
And this six degrees of separation shit is real. So you also have to be mindful of who you said shit to. Because you don't mm. know if it's going to get back to the person you're talking about. Mm. And you also don't know how soon or how long it will be before you cross paths with the motherfucker you're talking on. Mm. And accountability was real. When you said the wrong shit and you run into a motherfucker, you might have got your fucking face broken for it. And that wasn't such a bad thing because it made people rethink how they should act and how they should live. And it was called being a little more mindful and a little more res respectful. And even if you had an issue with somebody, you would be a little more conscious about who you say it to. And maybe you would be a little more courageous about speaking to them directly so that the conversation could be a civil one, even if it's to agree to disagree. But nowadays, you know, you see all of these people talking crazy. You want to try to cancel a God like him? That man been fighting for our people his whole fucking career. That man been fighting for our people. He's actually going to try to get something for our people. How can you cancel a man that's going to try to get something for our people? Let me ask one question. Black and brown people, I done lived through, and if you and my age, we done lived through a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans being in office. Mm -hmm. I have not seen the benefit or the advantage of a Democrat or a Republican being in office because niggas still got killed the same fucking way, no matter which one of them was in the office. The disproportionate racial imbalance has not only been the same, but it's gotten worse. No matter which one of them was in the office for black people, and brown people. Mm -hmm. How the fuck we cancel an ice cube? Mm -hmm. You crazy? Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in the propaganda of these fucking shenanigans that these politicians play. Remember, they politicians. We people. How the voting shit work too, though, right? The voting thing works. When you vote, you, you vote for a president or you vote for the member of the electoral college? Which one is it? Well, it's two ways. It's two ways. It's the electoral college and, the, and you vote for, the, for, for whatever the president. I say, because I voted today, boss, right? And I don't mean you could be on here for four hours about that. But right. I say... Ice Cube is right to ask for accountability for black people. All he's asking for is, could you put down in paper what's really going on? The only thing that I think is a little wrong about it is, and I know they say the same gimmick every year, every four years, it's like, this is it. You got to vote now or, for, uh, or forever hold your peace or this country's going to the thing. So... I just can't stomach or digest our president right now. I can't watch him on TV talking all this divisive shit, splitting the country in half. So me personally, I would say that I'm with Ice Cube the day after Joe Biden wins and we'll hold him accountable to what Ice Cube is saying. I'm with him because... I have to agree with you. I had this conversation with my mother and father yesterday. We've been Democrats since I was born. And so I'm telling my mother, I said, listen, we are not the same black and brown people of 1970, 1980, 19, even though it was intelligent, but it was scarce, right? Now, we have really built intelligence on another level. Right. And our vote means we want to see what's done for our community. So I'm with Ice Cube in that one million percent. I just personally, Fat Joe, cannot stomach this guy on TV for four more years. I just can't. Personally. That's all I'm saying. I'm with you, Crack. One million percent. And about canceling, the whole shit is some fuck shit. The whole cancel nation, the whole whatever they're doing on Twitter is the biggest fuck shit I've ever seen in my life. You got a person 
who I, the way I deal with people is I deal with their integrity and their actions by years. So somebody can tell me, Bust, you never lied to me, Bus. You can actually come in my house and there's a million dollar wa watch there and you possibly could have been the only dude in this motherfucker and the watch is missing and I couldn't say Buster Ron stole it. Because I'd be like, yo, I know this man 20 something years. He ain't never like, I got to go on the track record. And then what the Thank fuck you. are we living for if we can't judge people by their track record? That's all I'm saying. So like, with Ice Cube, he's a million percent correct. I'm with him. I just need personally, bust, and I know we can talk forever about this. I need this guy out of here. Like, just I'm with you. I'm with you, King. I'm with you. But I'm going to be honest with you, King. You know, as much as we need Trump out of here, we also need to make sure these politicians which they are so trained to be incredible politicians. They know how to put that face on. They know how to lie with the straight face. They know how to look in your fucking eyeball and lie. They know how to do that so well. They've done it so long to our people. They promise so much shit. They don't make good on their word. There's no accountability for it. See, I'm going to watch this, and I'm going to watch a lot of people that got these perspectives, and I'm going to really look to see what y'all going to say when we're about two years in, if Biden wins. Matter of fact, let's say when Biden wins, because I'm tired of Trump nigga too, right? So, you know, everybody got their shit with them now. I said first day. Listen to me, boss. Let me let me just First finish day. crack. Let me let me just finish crack. Everybody got their shit with him. Biden got some shit with him that he's, you know, he realized he made a lot of mistakes on mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. Some of these things are not even um there's a few things that ain't coming up too. But we're gonna leave it where it is. All I'm saying is I'm watching these debates, I'm watching the campaign trail. We are in a different space in our life, Crack. Not only because we was raised a certain way, but we really are tired, like Cube, of being lied to. We are tired of being lied to, Crack. And that's why this accountability shit is so real, brother. So I well, just really I just want- I say, the first day after inauguration, Biden got to sit down with everybody and let us know. Because in the next few years, they ain't running this again. They not, they not running this play. The next election is the most, they're not running that in three years. I don't even know. I don't, want I don't even know. Crack, crack. I don't even know if motherfuckers is going to be willing to hear any of that shit after he win. It's not going to be no reason to because he done secured his win already. What the fuck? He got to sit down and talk to anybody for after he got what he want. Listen, they have a fraternity called the Democrats. Everybody will be in trouble. And I'm telling you, I'm a lifetime Democrat. I never voted Republican in my life. Let me Likewise, by the way. Likewise, by the way. Never voted Republican in my but life. they're in trouble. On, on, a, on, a, on a local level and on a fucking presidential level. Never. But they're in trouble. The Democratic Party is if we don't see real results for the black and brown community on paper, new laws and all that, in the next three years, they're in big trouble. Like big... But we're not going for it. We're not going for it no more. I already saw my mother and father. This is how deep this shit is, boss. I sat down with my mother and father, the people who taught me how to vote. I said, look, we're not going for this shit no more. We're going to get Biden. We're going to go a lot for him, but we want to see results. Ice Cube's not wrong, but I'm just saying, you see how them boys ran with the throwing the Trump hat? Oh, the yeah, nah, guy. nah. But yeah, they, they, the fuck we level is, is unprecedented, bro. We are seeing the fuckery level on a, on a, on a, it's, it's reaching new heights, crack. Like we've never seen none of this. This shit nah. we watching right now, this shit is definitely out of some fucking, some, some, some Hollywood script from somewhere. Oh, no, no, this is a movie. This I, is I all the way a movie. Who, all I the way. I will tell you who, 
I won't tell you who, but our brother, you know who I'm talking about. Our brother. I'm chilling with him, and he says, yo, I want you to know this is a movie. I said, yo, what do you mean? Oh, no, we living in a movie. Like, he like, yo, in two years, 2020 is coming out in the theater near you. He said, this shit is a movie. I'm looking at him, he's like, this is a movie. Like, I want you to know in two years from now, when all this shit is over, this going to be the biggest movie Hollywood ever made. That's real There's shit. There's so much fuckery going on all over. This shit is crazy. It's beyond but, crazy. Boss, I want to take it back to, uh, and it, you know, we, we, we rock it. Flavor in your ear remix. Right. LLU, Biggie, rest in peace, Craig Mack. Rampage. Rampage went crazy on there, too. No doubt. Oh. Uh, Everybody wanted to rap on that beat right there. How did you feel when you jumped on there with LL? You, you, you was on there with the greatest of the greats. Um, how would you how did you feel? What what is your best remix that you that, that you was on that you that you most proud of being on? And was there ever another remix that somebody else made, another artist, that they didn't call you for the remix and you was like, if I'd have got on that shit, I would have fucked that remix up. Um, the first thing is, the first question to answer is, how did it feel being on Flavor in Your Ear with LL Big, Craig Mack, Rampage? There's no greater feeling than to be in the company of LL, period. That's, that's like, before we could get to anybody else, to be able to do anything with L, if that ain't the most dream come true shit for a nigga like me and you, yeah, crack, it's my dream. That was my dream come true to ever be able to do something with one of the most dangerous swordsmen lyrically to ever exist in this culture to this day. So L, and one of the best to ever do it, period. That's the GOAT for real. So that in itself was some shit that still, I'm still floating on that cloud. I can't even front. You knew he was on there when you yeah. got your first. Yeah, I definitely knew he was on there. Um, Big was 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 starting to really get into this magical place, and it was like, wow, I'm, I'm watching this evolution happen with him right before my eyes. That was just like fucking shit, bro. Craig was already leading the charge because big wasn't really out out yet it was just this was craig's moment you know he, he's leading the bad boy charge so when i came to puff well when i got the call and i i came i came to puff to to get on the record when they reached out to me to get on it my situation at the time was breaking rampage I already knew what I was going to yeah, do. Yeah, how you even finagle that? Like, you on the record with, with LL, you on the record with motherfucking B.I.G. It's the <laughs> hottest record in the universe. Like, I mean, I remember one day, my birthday at the Fever, I had anybody you could name there, and every single rapper was like, yo, throwing the crate back, me, throwing the crate. Everybody <laughs> rapped on that shit. I'm like, and then you got Rampage, who is fairly new, on the remix. How did you finagle that? So this is what happened. I told Puff, I need Rampage on this record. It's my new artist, and the motherfucker get busy. Let him get on. If you don't like the verse, you ain't got to use it. We ain't looking for no bag for him. We just want the look. So this is how Puff did his brother at the time. He knew he had to pay Buster Rhymes. But you know Puff a hustler. Oh. This, this, to this, day. This, this, to this, this day. Puff one of the greatest hustlers to ever do it. It's big up to Puff. But my brother said to me, you want your man on this? First of all, we got to love the verse. 
Secondly, you want your man on this motherfucking record, bro? You got to do your verse for free. I said, that's how you going to do me, nigga? He said, I'm not doing shit. You choose. I made my choice. We playing chess, right? We ain't playing checkers, right? There's a bigger picture here, right? Okay, cool. I got to situate my man. Rampage got to have this look. This ain't no other opportunity might ever come around like this again for him to be in such great company. You know what I'm saying? So it was a legendary chess move. I am the most proudest of that decision that I made at that time under the circumstances. And if I had to do it again, I'd do it the fuck again. For another one of my new artists, he could be in great company like that because I got some phenomenal artists. Big up OT Genesis. Big up Stove God Cooks. Big up Prayer. Big up Murder Mook. Big up J Doe. Big up Trillion. Fuck you, man. By the way, OT Genesis got the monster new single out right now with Charlie Wilson and Chris Brown. Please go and experience that, people. And by the way, one of the best albums to drop this fucking year, and I've comfortably waited to say this shit because this project has been out for some, some months. But I just wanted to see all of the other shit that might have came out so that I can comfortably say this. Stove God Cooks has an album called Reasonable Drought. And it is produced entirely by Rock Marcy, my other fucking brother. This has to be one of the most incredible albums. I, I would be comfortable enough to say top three albums, hands down, this entire year. And if y'all got any back talk, don't give me no back talk prematurely. Because I ain't entertaining none of that. <laughs> Do yourself the biggest fucking favor and go listen to Stove God Cooks' Reasonable Drought album. And then maybe you could comment in one of my grand posts a few days from now. Because you need to replay it probably two or three times and experience the whole experience from top to bottom without skipping a song. See, y'all so used to just picking shit apart because of these streaming platforms and shit. Y'all ain't even doing yourself the, the justice of being able to appreciate what really goes into the intricacies of putting together a cohesive body of work. Y'all missing out on so much magic. Just the way a song goes into the other song. There might be some shit in that little 10 seconds that's such a magical fucking moment that you missing out on. Treat yourself to that. It don't take more than about an hour, one day, so you could just appreciate the refreshing, refreshing first time experience. The second day you get to dissecting the shit, you wanna start rewinding punchlines and metaphors. And then the third time you listen, you're very clear and you got an understanding of what the fuck is going on. Then you could comment. Then you could call me and talk about what I'm talking about. But again, big up motherfucking Stove God Cooks and the rest of the conglomerate family. That's that. What's the remix you wish you was on that you ain't get on? Okay. Let me think about this. Overall, or are you talking about old shit or recent shit? Overall, any overall, you heard a remix. Not recent. It could be anything. Recent or old. What's the song you I'm gonna heard? tell you, I'm gonna tell you the remix that I wish I was able to rhyme on. When it was new and fresh. But I ended up doing my own version of this shit on the Genesis album anyway. But when Pete Rock did Shut Him Down remix for Public Enemy, I, I cried down. that shit, bro. I, I cried. I cried several times. Like, it wasn't just one time I, I cried. Like, crap, you remember what the fuck that beat and that remix and that marriage with Chuck D's voice and that production made you feel like Yo, that shit was crazy. Yo, you know how we used to wish certain records was ours? You remember how yeah. we used to do that a lot? We would be around a nigga, we love their records so much, but we couldn't even really say it to him. I wish your fucking record was mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know what I'm talking about, Crack? Yo, that was one of them records, bro. Mm -hmm. I just was like, you know another record that did that to me? 
the world is yours remix that Pete Rock did for Nas Elmatic album two. Jesus Christ. I think I rhymed on that beat on a doo-wop mixtape because I couldn't take it. You know, for me, it's banned from TV. You know something? You're absolutely right. I forgot. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't forget that. I think I rhymed, on the, I, I rhymed on a remake version of Banned from TV. Later on, Nori did it over. I wanted in on the original so fucking bad, crack. Yeah, that so was it. bad. Man. When that shit comes on to this day, my goosebumps goes on, and I'm just like, oh, my God, that shit is amazing. Bad for TV. Uh, shout out to Swiss on the check-in. Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah. That bad for TV. But you but, but you put your foot in uh, Andy Upsass. You put your foot in, in a victory. Matter of fact, victory. I, big, big salute to MOP, Remy Ma, and motherfucking Tef, because... The 20 year anniversary of Annie Up just passed. Just passed a couple of fucking days ago. You know, Bro. Fame called me a couple of days ago. I was sleeping. And when I woke up, I seen the fucking shit and Static Select was like, yo, Fame was calling you. And I was like, oh my God, tell him I love him. I my love him. Brother, love MOP to, 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 for to infinity lifetimes. For infinity lifetimes, bro. Real shit. Yo, boss. Yo. It's been 11 years. I could talk about extinction level. I got so much shit, bus. But bus, we're gonna break this off. It's, it's, we're gonna break a record. But, <laughs> um, all right. All right. And my thing is, it took you 11 years to make this album. Now, this album is the holy grail of holy grails. <laughs> no, no, it's no. It's wow. like, it is what it is. I don't want to talk about certain things. Uh, tell me why 11 years, why? Uh, how do you work on an album in 11 years? And I know you got like 500 songs. <laughs> How do you think? <laughs> Yo, boss, you in the studio for 11 years. You've been in the studio every night. That's, that's a fact. I don't even know how you could pay for the budget for a studio for 11 years. There, there is mean, no every there is, night. There, there is no budget. It's just it's just my money, and and I love the studio, and I don't think that anyone is more of a testament of investing in yourself than me. Because I don't know anybody who wants it more than me. Still. Artists out there, invest in yourself. You heard Bus. Real shit. Invest in yourself. Continue, Bus. 11 years, Bus. I know who's on the album. It's fucking out of this fucking world. <laughs> no. Yo, Bus, this ain't no regular type. Shout out to Breon. Breon on the check. And I'm well, Breon, later, Breon, Breon, salute. Breon, salute. Um... I do want to say big shout out to Jamie Foxx. He's he's going through a turbulent time right now. Um, I didn't know that. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't want to put it out there it, it, on no negative shit. It's, it's 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 just you know family lost a, a very significant loved one in his family. I and, know. Um, I gotta hit him up. I love Jamie, man. Yeah, I, I just I brother. just want I want everybody real quick to just send they they most beautiful. You know, prayers and, and and incredible energy to our our brother Jamie Fox and just wish him well through this this challenging time. And Jamie, we love you and and, and you know, may the blessings continue to be bestowed in, on overflowing levels on you and your family during these times, brother. I love you and forgive me if I disclose. Yeah, he's one of the best you. people I know on earth. Real talk. He's one of the best people I know on earth, Jamie Fox. Makes everybody happy. Always makes you feel good. He always comes through for everybody. So prayers out to, to Jamie. No talk. Um, damn. Um, yeah. That's crazy, boss. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw the energy in a, in a negative place, but you know, we we know that we we got to start being a little more responsible and taking the initiative with keeping each other up. You know what I'm saying? especially during these times, you know, again, like we was talking about earlier, 
you know, as men, we're not really allowed to talk about when we're going through vulnerable times and, and vulnerable spaces in our lives. And we got to stop letting that shit be okay. Like, we should be able to start being more of a resource to each other, bro. And it's okay to ask each other for fucking help. You get what I'm saying? Like, I think, you know, it's it's imperative, especially in these times. I think people forget that, you know, as you get to these certain stages in your life, when we get to certain ages, you know, we realize that we only have one or two cycles in life left. When you've been through one or two or three of them already, and you're at the midway point, we've been through three. We've been through. We've been through three. Well, we've been through three. We've been I've been through four before the three in the street. <laughs> that was like ten cycles. Real shit. Y'all, I'm, 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 I don't even believe it, man. I it's can't just, even believe it. It's a, it's a blessing what we've survived, and, and you were particularly, and, and what we here able to do in celebrating each other with this kind of dialogue we having. But with what we learned with and from the shit we done been through, how are we applying the shit that we've learned? And are we applying the shit that we've learned the way we're supposed to? I know, and particularly when it comes to the way we say we love each other, the way we say we we rock with each other and support each other. I'm I, I'm I'm not with the talk no more the way I used to. Be okay with a person saying something and not living what they say. That don't mean that you have to do anything for anyone. It's still a choice thing. None of this should come with pressure or stress. But if you are in the position to help a brother, a friend, a loved one that you know really need it, and they are worthy of that blessing from you, you ain't taking nothing with you when it's time to go. Oh, you never are. Never are. So talk to these people. Give me one minute, boss. I'm coming right. I gotta use the bathroom. Got you, King. Got you. Got me fucked up. <laughs> talk to them one second, boss. Yo, yo, I, I, I'm gonna spend this time to acknowledge a few people. I do wanna. I want everybody to big up Vibes Cartel. It's one of the most incredible and the most one of the most profound artists to ever exist. Period. I want everybody to big up Buju Bantan. Another one of the most incredibly profound artists to ever exist. I want everybody to big up Bounty Killer. That man is responsible for giving birth and breathing life into so many artists from dance hall culture. Big up Ninja Man. That is my brother and my friend. There's a lot of other artists that needs to be acknowledged on the dance hall circuit. I just want to big up the whole entire dance hall in Jamaican culture. Because that's what made me. That's what gave birth to hip hop. Period. Boss. What's good, Crack? Flowers. Thank you. You know, for many years, I thought Sade was her name. Mm. I didn't realize it was a group. I always thought it was Sade. I always thought, I, 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 yo, I always thought that too. I found that out later on. You're absolutely right. Yo, yo, it's a fucking group, right? Hold on one second. I got a big up Be Worried. Y'all gonna learn who Be Worried is. Y'all know him, but y'all don't know him. Stay let me tuned say something, Be Worried. Boss, boss, this is a big moment, though. You gotta let me finish this one. Got you. If Buster Rhymes, the name Buster Rhymes was a group, we would have to include one of the main ingredients which is split style you know on the bumble cloud you mean fat yo of course you have to include split style man you mean man bumble cloud star <laughs> tell me about your relationship with split star is you, you i even remember when you played um the joint for me and biggie split was it like you too because with no disrespect to Dougie Fresh, because Dougie Fresh is one of my role models. You are the greatest entertainer of all time. I mean, and, and Doug is beyond a living legend of a living, you know, we love, right? Because that's the only person, right? But your boss, tell me about you and Split Star. 
how you met, what's this relationship, what's this organic, like, nobody else is like you two, bro. Thank you, Crack. I mean, first of all, I love the fact that you, 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 you're giving me an opportunity to really express my gratification and my love for Spliff. Like, Spliff is my best friend. I got a few really incredible best friends that <clears throat> they come from my very, very, and it's not just my humble beginnings, just my beginnings, period. Spliff Star, my DJ Scratcher Tour, my brother Kev Webb, and my brother Special. These are all 34, 35 year in better relationships. Every last name that I just called. So I'm talking like me and Split first really had our real, we knew each other before this moment, but this is the moment that turned us into friends. Me and my cousin Eric and Troy Avenue between Church and Linden Boulevard, Church Avenue and Linden Boulevard in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, my cousin. We always raised in my cousin's crib. My cousins are Nab, Tashi, Mike Burroughs, and Michelle. And that house, that was like the house that the whole block loved to come to, right? Because my Aunt Zonia and my Uncle Tony got five kids. They all is in similar age group. And it was just a turn up in their crib all the time because there were so many kids in that house. And Mike, God bless his soul, he was a DJ. And, you know, Eric was just the street kids and Nab and Tash, you know, them was just the, the cute girls in the family and on the block and in the neighborhood. So me and Eric, we got birthdays two days apart. He's May 18th, I'm May 20th. So my aunt used to have birthday parties for us at the same time where we would share the birthday celebration, two cakes and the whole shit. Yeah, me and Uncle Dad, my, my birthday's the 19th, his the 20th. We were so poor, we had one cake from both of us. We got that down the that's real nah, that's real shit. Fact. That's the way we came up. So again, that same being on a budget, it wasn't no two separate birthday parties. We had to do them shits together. Let's knock this shit out one time. Kill two birds with one stone. Real shit. So <laughs> we used to have these fake marriages with the cutest girl that we might have had a crush on in the neighborhood that was in our age group in, in, in our aunt's crib, right? So Janice, which is also a blood relative to the family, I had a crush on her, but obviously nothing ain't happening. We family. So I'm seven years old at the time. Spliff had a crush on her. Spliff is eight years old. It's my birthday, so I get to marry her. I have the fake marriage ceremony, everything lit. The marriage is over. Spliff was upstairs the whole time, but right before the marriage happened, Spliff disappeared. He went outside. Spliff playing outside with the kids that's in front of the crib or whatever. Like, he ain't stay to see the marriage. After the marriage done, I cut the cake. We take a couple birthday pictures. I want to go downstairs and play with Spliff and them. I come downstairs to play with Spliff and them. As soon as I get in the, set, the circle where they was playing at, the nigga Spliff slapped the shit out of me. Bow! Nigga, you married my girlfriend, nigga. And we start fighting. This is the very first fight I ever had in my life. All the family members come downstairs. They see me and Spliff carrying on. They break up the fight. They make us make up right there. Like we had to become friends and squash the shit right there. As soon as we squashed that shit, we became friends right there. I mean, we were friends before that, but we, we became like different type of friends because it was like we had a fight. You my brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We hugged. We got the plan. And something about that moment when we left from that shit, it was like we was happy to see each other the next time we seen each other, just to make sure it wasn't no more beef resonating. Boss, let me ask you a question, boss. <laughs> you ripped down many of stages. Right. What's the one time you looked at Spliff in his eyes and you told him, it's go time? 
I know all of you, but what's the one time, one show that you looked at him and you was like, yo, we're dying on this fucking stage. We better buy this shit more than anybody. What was the one show? It's two of those. Well, the one of them wasn't a show. One of them was just when I when Leaders of the New School was over and I needed to figure out how I was gonna move, because obviously I told you from the beginning I, I never aspired to do the solo thing. I always wanted to be a part of a dope support system. Um Spliff was always like the main attraction of the block. When block parties came and all type of shit like that, Spliff was the motherfucker in the middle of the circle that garnished the most attention because he's a showman. You feel what I'm saying? One day Spliff was on a moped riding down the block. One of them sprees. You remember them sprees and shit? <laughs> Spliff swerving back and forth in the street. Motherfucker hit the back of a double park car. A nigga flipped up in the sky, fell. Nigga split his shin bone straight down the middle. Not across, straight down the middle. And nigga refused to shed a tear in front of everybody. Bone sticking out the fucking skin, the whole shit. Ambulance came, picked up Spliff, put Spliff in the ambulance, the door closed. As soon as the ambulance started turning the corner, that's when you heard Spliff bawling like a newborn baby, my nigga. Spliff goes to the hospital, comes back. Spliff got the wild pigeon toe walk. <laughs> I leave, doing my thing in Long Island, shit work for a little bit. When it breaks up, Spliff, I should still come back and visit. Spliff used to be on crutches with the cash on his leg. But like, if there was a block party or something happening, that nigga Spliff would go right in, in the middle of the block party. And you know that shit you be seeing Fabio firing and all of them doing with the one leg shit? Spliff was doing that on the crutches way back then. But see, that comes from the day. culture. Yeah, but he'd be on the crutches and he'd just be bouncing his fucking little one leg shit like, you know what I'm saying? With the crutches. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. With the cash and the crutches. And, you know, Spliff, he just would make motherfuckers bust legal shots for him and they putting their hands in the air and they saluting him because he just didn't give a fuck. Like, the show must go on with Spliff. He always displayed Spliff that. Spliff don't give a fuck. Spliff don't give he a don't fuck. don't give a fuck. And Spliff, Spliff, you know, he really come from the dirt. Spliff, Spliff didn't got behind the wall. I done got the phone calls from him. Spliff was on the front of the lunch line with champion suits on, champion sweatsuits on, two heron bones and Air Force Ones and Rikers. You feel me? Niggas ain't on the front of the lunch line with looking fly like that behind the wall, especially back then, unless you put work in. So that, that's Spliff. You feel me? So Spliff was always a, a, a super asset and a super showman and a super charismatic motherfucker. And he not playing when it coming to defending the, the people that he loved. That's a fact. And, and, Let me ask you something, boss. What wait, wait, wait. I didn't, I, didn't answer the, I didn't answer this question okay. yet. So when I broke up with leaders and came back for Spliff and Scratch It All, I told him it was go time for real Spliff. He wasn't playing. He was. It was almost like he was waiting to hear that because he was tired of doing what he was doing. Mm. The show that me and Spliff knew we had to destroy niggas every single night, and it was a serious go time, not that we didn't value the seriousness of every show when we got on stage every time prior to this moment, but that No Way Out tour with Diddy and them in 97. Mm. Jay-Z, Foxy Brown, Dipset was on there as an opening act, and, and Puff and Mace and the whole bad boy at the, at the end. That tour, I think Usher was on that tour too. Usher had dates on that run too. This was 97, No Way Out tour. When we got to that and it was arenas every night, and we had a fucking time slot that was right before Diddy. So it was almost like we was the co-headliner without being called the co-headliners. Mm. Because this is when Put Your Hands was white sizzling hot, right? And Diddy let us come out there and have so much stage space that we was able to bring out the craziest stage production like I built, I built Castle Grayskull from the He-Man cartoon on the stage and used to come out the mouth of Castle Grayskull. 
We had boxes on the fucking stage that I would appear and disappear in. Like, magic trick shit was happening on the set. And we knew once we got past that intro, we had to perform to the point where it felt like we was going to have minor health crises is going on because we knew we wanted it so bad that we was ready to perform to the point where blood was going to come through the skin bro and that's just yeah 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 boss i've done quite a few shows with you and i ain't gonna lie boss I always say, yo, I gotta bring my A game because bus is coming up. Yeah, like I'm like, yo, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta die on this fucking stage. <laughs> you know they coming on and they're about to kill this shit, legend. Like, <laughs> you even step your game up, or yo, like, oh, you're nothing. You can't, like, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, bus is on there. It's like, and so, so that was the tour. That y'all were like trying to die on stage. You tried to die on that motherfucker every night. That's a fact. Every single night, crack. Like, we was getting on stage right before Puff, so there was not one empty seat. I've been on tours in Madison Square Garden, 91. I went on the PE tour. It was me. It was Oak Town 357. It was Scarface. It was Naughty by Nature, Queen Latifah, Ice T, MC fucking Light, Kid and Play. Like, Tribe called Quest, Son of Berserk, and the Hell Raises Leaders of the New School, all on one bill. But we was the niggas that was getting on before people even paid for their ticket. So we was performing for a completely empty venue. And we would perform so hard because we knew that once we was loud enough for niggas on that line to hear us that was at the concession stands or that was getting their tickets punched, they was going to start running inside to see what was going on. So we was the niggas that was trying to get people to their seat. I, I remember that feeling. I didn't want to go back to that. So now that I'm on at a time slot where I'm getting on right before the headliner and I'm looking like one of the biggest things right before the headliner, I'm coming for blood. I don't want no prisoners. Everybody got to die. That was the mentality because I don't ever want to go back to canned food. I'm eating steak now. Yeah. And if I'm going to eat canned food, it's going to be at my choice because it's nothing wrong with having the $2 million, $3 million, $4 million out of crib and you still got your motherfucking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches neat in the motherfucking expensive Sub-Zero fridge with the fucking wheat bread and you still going in there making your shit like you ain't forget Section 8. You know, I, we still them niggas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I ain't got public sandwich here. I go get me the... Uh, the bologna with the yellow mustard on the hair, they be like, oh, you, you, you get on for real. <laughs> you get on for real. I'm like, yo, bro, this that real shit right here. I come up on this shit. Every now and then, I got to reward myself with a bologna. <laughs> real shit. I, with I'm mustard it sandwich so I can know the difference. That's a fact, bro. It don't matter that we on our fitness and wellness. We still get cheat days. You get to eat what the fuck you want, <laughs> nigga. Fuck you mean, son. <laughs> Yo, boss, let me ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. what, you, what you want the world to remember Buster Rhymes as when you gone in a million years from now? What, what, what do you want them to, 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 to take from Buster Rhymes as a person, as a man, as career legacy? What, what do you want them to take from it? Um, several things. Um, I think the most important thing for me that people walk away with is that I, I'm, I'm a man of principle. I'm a man of morals. I'm a man of integrity. I'm a man of respect. And I'm a giver and I'm a, I am love to love. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the most important thing that I want people to understand. Like, I love to love. I love to give love. I love to make people know that I, I appreciate them. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's been a beautiful thing with the way I was loved. My, my mother and my father loved me for real. My, mm -hmm. my, 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 my family, my, my kids, my, like, I've been raised in a loving way, bro. Mm -hmm. 
know what I'm saying? So I, I got a lot of love to give, bro. And that shit is important to me, especially in a time where, you know, there's a whole lot of things trying to create obstacle courses and stop us from being able to show this love to each other. All this six feet apart shit and all of this, the shenanigans with the inconsistency of this information about this COVID shit. With all due respect to everybody and how they want to deal with that, there's no such thing in the planet that's going to make me stay six feet apart from the people that I love. I'm sorry. If I love you, I love you, man. And I'm going to show the motherfucking people that I love how much I love them. I'm going to hug you, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm going to shake your fucking hand. Just as long as you ain't coughing and sneezing around a nigga. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, I think it's important that we don't lose that affectionate shit. And we don't lose saying it to each other and giving each other their flowers while they're here. And also making sure that we defend our respect, integrity, morals, and principles on a priority level because there's a lot of disrespect going on around here. A lot of it with no accountability. So that's important to me. We got children, they need to see that. They need to be reminded of the significant value of that. They running around here thinking they could diss people and troll niggas and ain't no punishment coming behind that shit because you want followers and shit? You want niggas to just click your likes button because you did some weirdo shit that you think ain't nothing going to come back to you behind it? Nah, we got to reinstate what accountability really means because these kids need it. Last but not least, I want to be remembered for doing something that helps shift the climate in a productive way on a global level. That's real shit. That's why I'm so adamant about sharing information and knowledge itself and I try to incorporate it in everything that I do whether we regularly conversating on all of my albums you know it's not an accident that Extinction Level Event 2 The Wrath of God is coming 11 years in the making on 2020 it's it's, it's it's important that people understand the thought that I'm trying to spark in this body of work. This album is coming out in nine days. 11 years in the making is about to be shared with the world in nine days. And when you take in this album and you sponge it up and you get the chance to live with it and digest it, all of these things that I'm saying that I want people to remember about me, you're going to take this from this album. And I hope that it empowers people while you have fun and you be entertained. But I also want people to know, too, because I love this thing that I've been blessed with as a gift so much, that I'm one of the most incredibly dangerous motherfuckers that ever touched this microphone. And we're going to give you know a friendly, friendly reminder when they get this out. It ain't just it ain't just touching the microphone, boss. It's, it's <laughs> anthems, it's classics, it's hits, it's underground shit. It's like it's beyond touching the mic. You you, you don't did it in every aspect of Wiener, genre, Janet Jackson, Mariah, <laughs> uh, like it, it, uh, uh, fucking uh Gabrielle Union as your wife, y'all trying to kill each other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You done did so much shit, boss. Uh, ain't no way. I mean, it's just no way to explain it, bro. It's Thank just you, no, bro. Like, like, I'm not going to lie to you. To interview you, you was the most intimidating person for me to interview, even though you my brother, because your, your history and your, your shit is so fucking long. And <laughs> this new album is going to add a whole nother layer to that thank you big because bro the new album's a classic thank they, you they can say you my brother i can say the new album's a classic oh like, man thank you like, bro. the, the thank new you. album is a classic uh i want to shout out showbiz born lord d-i-t-c every i'm gonna tell big you shout out you to the heard. host big shout out to the whole d-i-t-c showbiz born born i'm gonna lord. tell you something you Diamond. never heard oh see right? there's a joke for a moment on the way out Right. Every Buster Rhymes album would come out. We had like a ritual. Showbiz would come pick me up and and press play on Buster Rhymes album. And we drive through the Bronx, Times Square, 
And I just, he <laughs> laughing to himself. He back to talk. Yo, he fucking love this shit. Me too. But I'm mean, like, yo, all the fucking time. He also the person who played me Illmatic Nas for the first time. Wow. Yo, when it's fire, he'll come get you and be like, yo, God, come on, yo. We, we take the shit off, put the cassette in. It's on. And, um... Yo, big up yo. to showbiz, so big up, such a super big up to showbiz, man. AG2, yeah, man. super big up to showbiz, though, word. Yeah. My brother, we love you too much. The album in nine days, you see the movie I'm going to make is out of this world. That's a fact. T.I. already knows you want the smoke. A yes, sir. Yes, indeed. Yes, I indeed. T.I., let's, 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 let's do it for the culture, and let's just do it to just put the fucking, the shit talk to bed, like, after this, it ain't, ain't, ain't gonna be no more shit talk. We just Yo, gonna set the record. You. We gonna set the record straight, Ti, and we gonna motherfucking embrace with love, and we gonna give up the championship belt to who it needs to go to. That's that. Boss, I love you, my brother. I thank you. I appreciate you, man. I know I you love don't do you this for nobody. Shout out to our brother Nori. I know you yes. doing drink champs. Yes, yes, and you know I did say this on drink champs. We got to do a better job in honoring Chris Lighty's legacy. I tried. No, 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 no. Crack, crack, crack. We all need to be ashamed of our motherfucking self, crack. Every last one of us, we need to take responsibility. And it's cool because the upswing is we all alive and well and we can still get it done the right way. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it, do it. I'm there. Let's do it. That's that. One million percent. I love you, boss. Nothing but love, my brother. Love you, too. One more thing, I, one more thing. Okay. I just, I just want people to be clear. Again, Extinction Level Event 2, The Wrath of God, October 30th, 2020. Nine days away. I salute I everybody. Gonna, I ain't even going to lie to you, your bus. I see a T.I. Buster Rhymes battle on the 30th or the 31st Halloween. It's hey, about listen. to get ugly in the streets. Hey, yo, listen, we might. Yo, T.I. got a new album out. Let's, let's big up and congratulate T.I for his new album. Yo, congratulations, congratulations to T.I. Congratulations to T.I. And, and, and the album is scorching and the new single with Little Baby is a scorcher too. Matter of fact, give me, to the, to the give, me give me a verse. Give me a verse. Give me a verse on the remix, T.I. Give me a verse on the remix of the joint with you and Little Baby. Let's not play around. Let's work. Woo! Let's Love work. Love you, boss. Love Stay you, up, baby.